great honor for me to have been invited to give the keynote address and um beach beach pe main urdu mein bhi baat kar lunga taaki baaki logon ko samajh aayega kyunki iski tarjuma nahi hoga sabse pehle i would like to thank the fund for manjudaro and the government of sindh for all of the support for this conference uh the minister the secretary the director general and all of the staff dr kalimul lashari who has been organizing without their support this kind of event can never be held this was being planned for several years and i'm glad to know that this is happening on the 100th year anniversary of the beginnings of work at mohenjodaro so this is a very auspicious occasion the indescript has not yet been deciphered adi jo hai na wo puri nahi hoti so even though we know the numbers we knew the numbers the first day they excavated jab se ye yahan pe khudai shuru hui tab se pata tha ke ye aa raha hai ke nahi ye numbers ka kya matlab tha so numbers does not include decipherment as uh, i think andreas very clearly said the meaning of the numbers is something more complicated how do they what do they mean and how can they be interpreted and it will not be deciphered without the without the help of a bilingual text so bilingual like rosetta stone like behistun inscription we need to find a language uh, a, a script that allows us to show the indus script on one side and another language that we know on the other when i was a student i dreamt of finding that in balakot in harappa in many places after 40 years of excavation i begin to wonder if the indus people ever wanted us to read their writing ye bhi baat hai na ki shayad unko kisi ko samjhane ke liye nahi chahiye the ki ye tarjuma karna ho ye na mesopotamia mein koi bilingual text hai na misr mein na iran mein na badakhshan mein na kisi jagah pe na oman mein to iska matlab hai ki ye tehreer ek khaas tehreer tha jo sirf व्यापारी लोग सरदारी लोग उनके के लिए मतलब की थी इसके लिए ज़रूरत थी बाकी लोगों की ज़रूरत नहीं था सो दिस वॉज नॉट अ टाइप ऑफ लैंग्वेज दैट वॉज यूज टू राइट बिग इंस्क्रिप्स इट वॉज नॉट बींग यूज टू राइट मॉन्यूमेंट्स इट वॉज मैंट फॉर कम्युनिकेशन अमंगस्ट वेरी स्मॉल ग्रुप्स ऑफ पीपल इन माई ओपिनियन सो फाइंडिंग अ बाई लैंग्वेज टेक्स मे हैपन बट इट मे बी वेरी डिफिकल्ट and we need to do more excavations to find it we have dilmun so um stefan larsen showed that the writing of the indus valley was taken and used in dilmun and we know what that language was probably semitic language so indus script could be used for writing more than one language this is very clearly demonstrated we have writing in magan in oman but we don't know what it says but it's similar there are some types of attempts for writing and the indus civilization writing which is the third region melukha is the area which was incorporating more regions than more area than any other early civilization if you look at this map the indus civilization covers a larger area than other regions how did the indus urban centers integrate communities from diverse backgrounds into their s- cities how did they bring people together these are some questions that people need to i think study and we've been asking this for many years dr michael jansen has been looking at the architecture he talked about the urban planning if you have fresh water for every neighborhood then people will come to your city if you have walls that protect your markets from dacoits from bandits then people will come to your cities if you have drains that take the dirty water away and allow you to live in a nice inhabitant area then people will come to your cities so they attracted people to their cities from the surrounding regions because they provided a place to live for many different people they had streets running north south east west as dr uh, jansen presented in mesopotamian cities the street went from gateway to temple and temple to palace <laughs> everyone else had to just figure out where they go there were there was no city planning in egyptian cities the streets went from the temple to the palace and to the gateway bus 
everyone else had to live around. But in Mohenjo-daro, there were big streets going across the whole settlement. Every, every part of the city had access. So this is the facilities that these cities had. And then we need to try to understand how they used writing, because the writing is used by elites to interact with each other to control these cities, to build the cities, to organize the cities, and to maintain them. And they did this for 700 years. So 700 years they were able to use this writing system, and actually from before the early Kordijian period, they were used this writing system to integrate and hold together this civilization. We also need to think about what happened that resulted in the disappearance of the writing. So this is what I will cover a bit in my presentation today. Writing is used to gain power. So writing today is used to gain power. You can have power over texts. You can control them. That way you can control who knows it. Who has access to the Almighty in which the books are? Who has the control of the password for your computer to get to the, the, the information? You can also control by use of texts. If you put the text on the wall, everyone has to read it. They have to know what it says. If you are ignorant of the law, then you are not. You, you still have to obey the law. So you have to understand what is in that law. So we know that early civilizations had writing in different ways. So writing in, in China was used to communicate with ancestors. This was part of rituals. And we don't. We never needed to decipher Chinese writing because there was a continuity of writing from the beginning to the end and we can see the continuity of writing. There was no major break. In Egypt, there was a break. We did not have a continuity of writing. Writing disappeared, but there was still writing being used for ritual purposes in the temples, and that was important for legitimation. So when the Greeks conquered Egypt, they had to put an, a, a inscription in Greek to show that, I mean, in, in hieroglyphics, to show that they were legitimizing with their power in Egypt. Otherwise, the local people would not have, have supported them. And that's how we were able to decipher hieroglyphs with the Rosetta Stone. If it had not been found, we would never be able to decipher. In, in Iran, Sumerian was the first language system that was being used to write, uh, uh, cuneiform was using to write Sumerian. But Sumerian language became almost a dead language very soon. So Akkadian was the main language, a Semitic language that was used throughout Mesopotamia. And they had to have teaching programs to teach students how to read Sumerian. So we have lists of words in Sumerian and lists of words in Akkadian that were used by the scribes to teach the students how to read both languages. So in Mesopotamia, there were many languages spoken, but only one writing system. And this has helped us to decipher, because cuneiform was used to write many different languages, and it was also used to legitimize power. So even Daryavash I, who was a king of Iran, had to put in cuneiform on the side of a mountain that I am the king of the world, I have destroyed ten other kings, and he had to put it in cuneiform writing so that the people would so that he is linked to the old kings of the ancient days. And if it hadn't been for that, we would not be able to read cuneiform text. In the Indus Valley, we have no continuity. So at the end of the Indus civilization, the writing system disappeared, and there's no link to the later civilization because we have 900 years when writing was not used. You do not have to have writing to run, run a civilization. So Vedic culture had no writing. They had Varnamala, they had Panini, they had grammar, they had the Vedas, but they did not use writing. And they did not use writing intentionally because they were able to control knowledge by only memorization. So this is very important. So writing in this region disappears because people who had power over writing were no longer in power and another group came in who decided not to use writing and there is a break. And this is our problem because nobody put two languages together to write Sanskrit and Indus script together. 
this is a problem. So Maya writing was similar. I'm not going to go into the details, but again, translating Maya writing, people today are speaking Maya language. There was ways to connect some of the script. We can't read all of the Maya writing, but we can read some of it. So I'm going to go through this quickly. To, so the writing of a region is very closely linked to the way the bureaucracy is organized. And Indus bureaucracy was different than Mesopotamian bureaucracy. We can see that by the way they organize their cities, by the way they organize their trade, by the way their houses were organized. It's very different than Mesopotamian structure. There may be palaces here. There are large buildings. There are big buildings that are as bigger than any palace in Mesopotamia. And they may have been very big houses for local landlords, local very powerful landed elites. So they are in H DKG area, they are in HR area, they are even here on um, the uh, Stupa Mound. They have very big buildings. Each of those buildings could be a palace or a temple. They, they have different functions. We will never know what they were used for because the earlier excavators did not excavate the way we do today. So when I request permission to start excavation again, it's so that we can find one of these buildings and excavate it properly and recover the data in a way that will help us interpret what the ancient buildings were. So if we do new excavations, there are ways to preserve the material. There are ways to uh, uh, bury it and build a replica on top. Many cultures do this. In China they do it. In Europe they do it. You dig, then you rebury, and then you build a replica for the tourist to see. This can be done. And this way we can get the information and still protect the remains. Mohenjo-daro is the most important site to excavate because it has the richest remains preserved. I have been working at Harappa for 30 years. Harappa has no buildings left. All of the bricks were taken to build the Lahore Multan Railway. So they left only the dirt, and in that dirt we find many things, but we don't have the buildings. Mohenjo-daro has the buildings and it has the soil. It is the most important site to dig. Lakhanjo-daro is also an important site to dig. But Lakhanjo-daro has Sakkar city on top of it. So we have to remove Sakkar in order to dig Lakhanjo-daro. So it's difficult. Mohenjo-daro, we don't have to remove anyone. It is, belongs to the state. It can be protected, it can be excavated, it can be studied. And with that, we would be able to understand better the way in which this city was organized. In my presentation, uh, everyone else summarized their presentations. I'm going to add just a few points from mine that I, I'm trying to understand the origins of writing. We can see that the Indus writing was not sudden. It happened over a long period of time. And that it begins as early as 3700 BC and grows gradually over time. We can see that Mahargarh also has the roots and the early foundations of writing system. So Baluchistan and the sites in Baluchistan also are important. And we need to do something to preserve those sites and recover more information from them. It is during this early phase that we see the beginnings of trade networks linking all regions of the Indus Valley. This is the period which uh, Dr. Mughal called the Hakra, I call Ravi phase. It's the very earliest beginning of the uh, settled communities. During the Kodiji phase, we have the earliest writing emerging, which we have early script, even though it's not on, always on seals. We only have one seal with writing during the Kodiji phase, and that seal has no animal. So Ayumu uh, Konosukawa talked about early writing. The early writing is there on pottery, and one seal has writing on it. Uh, we may find some more seals with early writing as well. But it's very important that the writing system shows continuity between the, Kod, the Ravi to Kodiji to then Harappa period, showing a development of the writing system. The um, writing is also present at many other sites. So we were talking about how much data do we need to do machine learning. Everybody who wants to do machine learning, great. But we need more data. We need to excavate and re-excavate sites. So Kodiji needs re-excavation. Amri needs re-excavation. These sites that are being destroyed, we have to recover the data properly so that we can get more information about writing so that we can then understand the use of writing. Um, Mohenjo-daro 
also has early Cotdigian deposits. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the excavation of Wheeler, which is just here by the, the Citadel Mound. He reached to the very bottom in the water table and he found Cotdigian pottery, which I have the drawings here, from the lowest levels. So there is a Cotdigian mound underneath the, the Stupa Mound and Dr. Dales did a coring in the area of HR. Underneath HR area is also Cotdigian deposit. So we can fit, get early pottery even from Mohenjo-daro by coring and digging under the water table. If people can dig under the ocean with tunnels, we can dig under the water table in Mohenjo-daro. My master's exam by Dr. Dales was how would you excavate under the water table at Mohenjo-daro? So there is technology to do this. They do this for tunneling under rivers. They do it for tunneling under the ocean. We can dig under the water table here. It's not a problem. We have the technology. So we can find the data from the Cordigian period in Mohenjo-daro and it will, can be reburied and the site is preserved. It will not disturb the site at all. The origins of writing of the Indus civilization we can clearly see starts from the early Harappan, the Cordigian, and then the Harappa phase. The late Harappan has no writing. So writing began to disappear at around 1900 BC. The cities did not disappear. Mohenjo-daro was a big city at 1900. The Jukkar occupation is found in all of the Banger Mounds. In Jukkar, which is just north of here, there is an occupation. People were living here. They did not leave. Harappa has a late Harappan occupation, but they didn't use writing. They stopped using writing. There were big cities in the Indus Valley during the late Harappan period. So urbanism did not end. Writing did. So this means that a new group of Vaderas, a new group of Sardars came in charge and they said, we're not using writing. So they intentionally stopped using writing and they used a different way to organize. So the integration era is when people became integrated into big cities. They used weights, they used writing, they used ornaments, they had walled cities, they had transport, they had ways to bring things back and forth between different regions. The cities of the Indus were massive. And Dr. Janssen clearly pointed this out about how many people were living. I think that there were even more than 40,000 people living here. I think that these cities had 70,000 to 80,000 people and when it was Mela time there was even more people because they were living outside the city wall not just inside the city wall so the big cities had to be able to take people during a very big festival how many have you been to Sewan Sharif during Urs? Kitne log gaye Urs, Urs mein? Bohut beer hota na, chota gaon hai magar when the Urs happens thousands of people come so cities have to be able to handle people during festival time. And festival time is also trading time. So the cities were very big trade centers. Um, these are the photos of the Mohenjo-daro by the team of Janssen from uh, the balloon and the, hel uh, the plane. We have large cities like Rakigari, which is considered to be almost 350 hectares. We have the site of Lakhanjo-daro. Excavations in Lakhanjo-daro show that this city is more than 300 kilo, uh, hectares in area, underneath the western area. Lakhanjo-daro is a big, big city. And it should also be somehow preserved and excavated in different ways. Dholavira in Kutch, this is a big city, but it's organized differently than the other Indo cities because it's on an island. And it has three walls. It's called a Tripura, Tripura. So, teen diware hain, a fasile hain. And inside the center is where the big Sardar lived. So this was a city organized very differently than Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. Our, the, these cities had multiple walled areas. This had one consecutive walled area. And the development of writing goes through a, a series of stages. And I think that this is also helping us know that we have to develop more larger database for the earliest phase of Indus writing. How many signs were used? Uh, Ayumu estimates 71, we may have a few more, um, but still it's not very many. And how were they used? You have two signs, three signs together, and later studies show that even in the later periods, three or four signs are only the, the, the maximum being used. 
Uh, Kunosukawa did very good comparison showing this development, looking at the, be the, the seals from the Gagar Hakra area. And the Hakra is the area that falls from Gagar, Hakra, Nara. It flows all along the edge of the other side of Kodiji. So it's the, the main area where people were living on the other side. So Cholistan is also an area that needs to be studied. It has many seals and many pieces of pottery with writing on it. The number of inscriptions we see today, the different types of signs are uh, looked at by different scholars. We have different numbers, but we need to be able to study them by chronology, not just all of them in one tokri, in one basket, looking at them together. They have to be separated out chronologically. Um, uh, uh, Brian Wells has been doing some interest, very important studies. He was one of the first people to show how diverse some of the signs are and how they relate to different types of weights. Um, we have also uh, Michael Janssen and his team, their study of where seals are found within buildings. This is uh, the area in HR, which is studied by Uta Franca, and it shows all of the important seals within a building. Now this is reconstructed based on the archaeological data rec recorded in the 1920s and 30s. We can do much better than this if we excavate a house again. And if we excavate one or, one or two houses, we should be able to have a lot more information about how seals were used in these big cities. Um, Andreas Fools uh, has been doing some amazing work with the um, segmentation and breaking down of the writing. So we can now understand that writings, as we can divide it into different groups. And some of these relate to numbers, some of it relates to weights. So even if we can't decipher, we have an understanding of what the structure of this writing is. So when we get more data, these techniques that have already been started will help us to be able to learn a lot more about the writing system than we had known in the past. Uh, the writing system does change over time, even within the 700 years. So during 3B, we have a different combination of signs. During 3C, we have different combinations of signs and new signs coming in. And um, the study of how seals are carved is one of the important things that Dr. Jameson was also showing how we can look at workshops and how people are making them. So far, only a few workshops have been found for making seals. So how these, these seals were very important. They were used by the elites to control, and that means the workshops would have been very, very well controlled because they produced some of the most important objects. And we need to find some workshops. We need to do excavations to locate workshops and excavate them to better understand production of this important commodity. Um, the, t the, t the studies that he's done, he's already summarized, so I won't go into detail, but basically there's some patterning that can be studied, and also he shows that it's decentralized. So Mohenjo-Daro had s multiple seal workshops. Dolavira had seal workshops. Harappa had seal workshops then who controls who makes what and what workshop? Because you can't have everybody making things all differently without some kind of coordination. So there must be some linking coordination that we have to find. And then the studies by Dennis Frenez is very important because it shows that we have a use of a technology for documenting administrative activities. So this is not just stamping seals on a bundle and sending it to Mesopotamia. It's controlling who goes in and out of rooms, who opens bundles, who doesn't, who closes bundles. And then the exciting thing is that he may have evidence for use of sealing from manuscripts. If that can be found, then we need to find the manuscript. And proper excavation tells us that we can find them because um, uh, Hassan Kokar in Harappa, curator of Harappa, excavated a site near Harappa. He found a birch, man birch bark manuscript of the Kushana period still in a basket in uh, the site near um, uh, across the river. So basically we have clear evidence that we can find these manuscripts today. So we, if we excavate properly, we will find them. In the past, they had 800 workmen, dug our dug, they were just digging fast as fast. They were not looking at anything carefully. Today we have the technology. If we find a manuscript, we can preserve it. Even if it's burned, we can preserve it. So this is something that needs to be restudied. 
Uh, writing is used on many different surfaces, pottery, and um, uh, for shipping, as well as for bangles, tiny little inscriptions written on bangles. We have writing associated with uh, religion and ideology, and the number system, which everyone, has, we talked about earlier, but it's very important to show that this number system is still used today. This same kind of numbering is used when we talk about um, uh, uh, buying sabzi, <laughs> when we count talas in music. Yesterday we had a music night, so tintal is how many beats? No, tintal is not three beats. It's 16 beats, right? So you had, these are ek do teen char, paanch che saat aat, no da si gyaar baara, tera chodha pandar sola, right? 16 beats. So this is counted on your fingers. And that's how Harappan's counted. So this is, you can see very clearly, groups of four. Chat. Okay? The bricks themselves are four fingers wide. They're four, finger, four fingers thick, four fi eight fingers wide, and 16 fingers long. So you have very clear use of four fingers and counting that goes from bricks to counting system to language to writing. There's lots of linkages that we can study. I think one of the exciting studies is that the writing is used to write more than one language. So this is clearly demonstrated in the Gulf. So uh, Stefan Larsen showed this, that this writing system is used to write a Semitic language. It's very cl probably an um, Amoritic language. That means that if it can be used to write a language in, the, in Bahrain, it can use to write, be writing many languages in the Indus Valley. So how many languages were spoken in the ancient Indus Valley? That was one of the questions that came up earlier. How many do you think are spoken today? How many languages are spoken between Baltistan and Makran? We have Balti, Shina, Hindko, Pashtu, all different languages in the north, and then Punjabi, Saraiki, Sindhi, Makrani. When does, when does Sindhi become Saraiki and when does Saraiki become Punjabi? Can anyone tell me? No, you can't. People who speak Sindhi can understand Punjabi, they can also s understand Sindhi. Or Saraiki. Saraiki can be linked to Punjabi and Sindhi. So languages changed over distance. So between Baltistan and Makran, we have four major language families and maybe five. So this is how it is today, and it was probably that way in the past. So the Indus script, I think, was used to write more than one language. That means that we have to be able to understand how to study that with computers. It's very complicated. Um, and in the final phase, they didn't use writing. So they chose not to use writing, and then we have to understand why. What was the function of this, and what was the benefit of this to this community? And then, because of this break, there's no link to Vedic Sanskrit. There's no link to Brahmi. Except, maybe there is. There may be some links in Rajasthan, maybe there are links in, in uh, Deccan area in India, and there might be some links into Brahui in um, the, uh, the areas of Baluchistan, so we may need to find some links between later time periods. The disappearance of the script is when people who were no longer using this, were no longer in power, had no way to manipulate and use script to reinforce their power. So those people lost power. The question is why? And I don't have time to go into the disappearance of the Indus cities, but basically the power of the elites is through land. If you don't have land that has grain that you can pay the workers, you cannot be a powerful Vardera, right? So you have to have rice, you have to have wheat, you have to have trade, and if your land is covered with sand, you cannot do this. So the rivers are changing, the rivers are moving. For deciphering the Indus script, we need to know that we can assume that it's logosyllabic, or logo, um, um, uh, logosyllabic is the main w uh, thing that people are arguing today. It cannot be translated without knowing what the language is. So first we have to know the language, and I just said there, has, there may be four languages, so that means different translation in different areas. And then the other thing which I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about is language X. So language X is the language that was spoken before all the languages we know today. 
So most of you probably don't realize it, but even in Sindhi and in Punjabi and in Bengali and all these languages, Hindi, Urdu, 60% of the words that are used are not linked to the modern languages. Those are the, langu the words of the Neolithic people who were the first people to be here and name the plants, the people to name the, f the types of tools using, that name the rivers, and this is a language system which we call language X. We don't know what the language is. So we will never know the language of the ancient people that were living in Mehargar because it's a much older language. So my conclusion is that we have made major advances. This conference is a major advance. We have had a very productive time to talk about m how we can move forward. And we can say that we cannot decipher it unless we have a bilingual text. And I strongly recommend that we have new excavations. We train students how to do them properly. It's not something to do in one day, but we have to have a training program through training students and then providing them jobs and providing them an infrastructure we build over the next 10 years a body of data that will be able to address this issue. So this is very, very important. And if we don't build this foundation, we will not be able to make progress. And this is something that I want to just leave with. The last point is that we have to look in a long perspective to really understand the problem. It's not something we can do in one day. Thank you very much. <laughs>